When I ask UX people who practice user research what is their biggest challenge, I often hear how hard it is to engage stakeholders with research. What are your thoughts on this topic? So the hardest part of software uh, and the hardest part of design isn't software or design. It's influencing culture. And so people and researchers, I think, are often optimizing for the wrong thing. They don't know the right words to use to influence an organization to make better decisions, right? So instead, they're like, here's our data, go use it. But that data isn't particularly uh, productized or, or made sexy. Um, so I think as a goal of a designer and goal of a UX researcher is not only to just present findings, but the real goal is to influence people. And if you start with that um, as your metric of success, you're going to make a whole bunch of very different decisions instead of sort of sitting back and complaining that nobody listens to you. Um, so one of the, the things that we did at, at Mozilla, and something I, I personally do, is that I, I won't hire a designer unless they can code a little bit. Now, you don't have to be a great coder. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why is that you have to be able to take your ideas and show how they apply in the real world or in product to the people that are actually making the decisions, the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. uh, Thucydides, I think, has a fantastic quote about this. Like, what, what 2,500 years ago does a, a Greek philosopher and historian know about software development? And he said something really interesting. He said, the nation or the society that separates its warriors from its scholars is a society that fails. Why? Because... Your, uh, the people doing your fighting are idiots, and the people doing your thinking are cowards. Now, I'm not going to tell you uh, of, uh, when you apply this to designers and engineers, which ones switch, but the, the idea is the same. So unless you have some sort of empathy within a group, nothing's going to happen. You're constantly going to toss the problem back and forth and back and forth. Mm -hmm. And so while there's certainly a lot you can do and hope for from product people... Um, or, or the stakeholder is wanting to know about more about your world, I, I don't think that's a useful starting place. Instead, I think it's the role um, and the job of the researchers and the designers to cross that empathy bridge um, mm -hmm. and present our findings in a way which is useful for the other people. All right. What would you recommend to in-house UX researchers who are always trying to identify opportunities for impactful research if they want to better identify such opportunities. So it's the old saying that the only useful statistic is one that helps you make a decision. Mm -hmm. um, that's an interesting and broad question. It was one of the, the precepts that I follow is that you should never let data dictate design because anything with alliteration clearly has to be true. Um, and the reason is, is that if you purely follow what people are currently doing, you will never give them a new set of behaviors, right? You're, you're optimizing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really easy to fall into the trap of saying, here's my data, um, this is what people are doing, therefore we should do more of that. Uh, and I think that's, it's often pushback that designers and product people will give to user experience researchers, saying, yes, you're showing me a great snapshot of how things are, but not how things could be. So I don't know if I have fantastic advice to an in-house UX researcher um, about how to go about pinpointing those new areas, but instead to keep that into the back of your mind, that, uh, that there, are, there are two types of research to be done. There's the type which is, you know, what's the market now? How do people actually use this product as it stands? And that's immensely valuable. Um, and should be presented as such. And then there's the, here are the opportunities for moving forward. Uh, and that, that's much harder um, and takes much more of a, a creative leap. Um, but if you can weave those two things together, then I think your ability to persuade people is, is much increased. All right. Uh
UX researchers sometimes experience a tension between conducting research they were asked to do by their stakeholders, for example, a product manager or engineering lead, versus research that they were not asked to do but think they should do. What are your thoughts on balancing this tension? Uh, this is a game of, of, uh, of playing cards. You know those, <laughs> those um, street magicians are like, pick a card, any card. And of course, you always pick the card they want you to. Um, that's your job as a UX researcher. Uh, you are the profession, which means that the product manager asking for the research doesn't actually know what they want. This is just like a user doing a focus group with a user um, where users will tell you all sorts of things they think they want, but they don't know what they really want. If you ever, you, you would never focus group your way into an iPhone uh, or into a Wii, right? Uh, those are merely just consensus devices showing you what most people think they want. So your product manager comes to you with a question. Your job is to listen to them, not their words, but listen to what they actually want. Um, same thing with almost all of your stakeholders. They'll ask you for something and they're asking for the wrong thing. It's your job uh, to use design thinking. What is design thinking? Well, design is a process of using, um, of turning constraints into advantages, right? It's that beauty which is design. That's why people come and flock to design. So what does that mean? Uh, that means that you shouldn't be thinking outside of the box. Uh, that's not the interesting question. The interesting question is to find the box, the set of constraints to think inside. So, what again does that mean? That means you need to be asking the right problems. Design thinking is really about taking a step back and figuring out the right problem to ask, because if you ask the right problem, the solution will fall out. Mm -hmm. So, your job as a, as a UX researcher is to listen to what people tell you, and then go find the right way of reframing that question to be the one they really meant. Uh, one that actually does gives you actionable statistics about um, where your product should go. So that's that's the biggest thing. The you should really be unifying the research you think should be happening with uh, re-asking people's questions uh, so that they're the way they should have been asked in the first place. Right. So again, it's about it, it's oddly enough, and I, I hate saying this as a guy that came through math and physics and cognitive psychology, this is about the soft skills. This is more about influencing people than it is about the particulars of your research, which is discouraging to say, but true. <laughs> yes, it is true, I agree. Can you tell me a story about a difficult stakeholder who did not understand or respect UX research? So, uh, we had a really interesting time um, getting Firefox Panorama into Firefox 4. Mm -hmm. um, because one, it was a volatile uh, thing. No, few people thought it was technically possible using JavaScript um, or on the, the timetables, uh, and therefore it was, was under resourced. And two, was that there was a lot of questions about whether the data supported people browsing a lot. Um, in fact, so Firefox Panorama lets you sort of zoom out very similar to, to expose plus spaces, mm -hmm. rearrange your tabs into logical and semantic chunks, um, and only look at the ones you want so that you, you don't have to deal with um, sort of cognitive overload or, or, as I like to call it, info guilt, uh, the knowledge of having that one tab sitting up there uh, that you're doing as a to-do. It's heavier uh, than, than a tab, but, but lighter than a bookmark, and you don't know what to do with it, and it just sits there and clears up your brain. Um, that's, that's Panorama. So... Uh, the research showed that, I, I can't remember the exact number, but the, the average number of tabs a person has open um, was, was, I think, uh, between four and seven. I don't remember the exact number. Okay. Um, and people were using this as a way of saying, uh, Panorama is a useless feature because people don't have enough tabs. But then when you actually look at the, the full distributions and, and test pilot uh, run by Tsinghua, and, and Jonah DiCarlo did, did a fantastic job of this, showing that they're actually, um, even though the average number is, is much smaller, they're a huge group of people that use um, this sort of long tail, that use more and more and more tabs. In fact, some of our, our advanced users had over a thousand tabs open at once, which is ridiculous. Um, I don't know what computer they were running. Um, 
And when you when you looked at the data in a different perspective, you sort of summed up everyone that's had more than 11 tabs, you actually got something like 25% of the population, even though the average um, wasn't all that high, right? So this is, of course, the, the, the stent problem of looking at a single mode of your curve instead of all of the modes of your curve. Um, and so there's two things that let us get over the, the idea that, and we started in a hole, um, we, were, we were told absolutely not, Panorama couldn't get into to Firefox 4, but we, we should try. Um, and our bargain was to, to build up a small team of external contractors to work on this to, to mitigate the risk. Um, and we did two things. One, we took data on how people actually used it. Did people open it up? Um, how many of those people that opened up stuck with it? And then we discovered it had really high stickiness value. So it was useful for the people that found it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and two, we, we went the other way around. We said, we, we have this gut feel that um, it'll work. When we test it with people, people really like it. Um, so let's make something feel sexy. So we did videos, um, lots of demos to people. We got people involved early on, so this is the soft sell, um, so that by the time uh, the final call was made, is, does this get included or not, it turns out a huge group of people that weren't necessarily involved with the project uh, directly got involved to make sure that it happened. Um, and in the end, that's what influenced those hard to convince stakeholders because all of a sudden there's this groundswell movement around it. Um, so a little bit about it was choosing a, a sexy problem. Um, a little bit about it was getting the right data to, to back up that it's a useful thing. Um, and then a lot of it was the, the legwork of convincing and influencing people. All right. Some UX practitioners believe that they should only provide findings and never offer recommendations following UX studies. They let their teams figure out what needs to be done by themselves, believing that this way these teams are more committed to act upon research. What are your thoughts on this approach? I think it is... I just want to say this. I think it is the uh, pedantically cleanest approach. That mm -hmm. absolutely you should separate the people that are making recommendations from people that are providing data. I don't think that works very well in practice because, uh, of course, it depends on the dynamics of your team and all, all of that. But generally, in small teams, um, or even larger ones, you're, you're given this data, and you're not given that, that conclusion. The, here are a couple things you can do. And people generally are, are lazy, given that they have a limited amount of time, um, and that time is, is sliced thinly. Uh, if the material that you give them isn't easily, uh, I just want to say this, isn't easily digested, then chances are it won't be digested. Uh, and if it is, then it'll be partially digested. So I think you should be very clear about saying these are the concrete findings um, and, and cordon those off. Mm -hmm. But you shouldn't be afraid if you're actually trying to have these things make change to product in saying here are a couple of suggestions based on that. Mm -hmm. um, so A, A and B, make sure they're separate. But I don't think you should um, always be beholden to that very pedantic ideal of having your team uh, that does the UX research be separate from the team that does the implementation. Um, I think there are much better ways of making sure that that empathy bridge is gap right because mm -hmm. essentially by keeping those two things separate, the hope is that any ideas that come out are fully owned by the team doing the implementation and because it's fully owned by them, they feel responsible for it because they're responsible for it, it's more likely to end up being in product. Um, but there are many other ways of giving people the feeling of, of shared ownership and, and responsibility. Uh, and I think most of it comes down to bridging the, the empathy gaps, yep. gaps between the different people. Uh, so that's much, much more important than that sort of odd separation. Last question. How can UX practitioners tell if their stakeholders are bought into research? How can UX practitioners tell if they're bought into research? If, if their stakeholders are bought into research. By which you mean that they think it's important to, to do research? 
think it's important or think it's it, or act upon research findings? How could you know? How could they know? Hmm. I haven't thought much about that one. Hmm. Because normally it feels fairly obvious when people are buying into decisions based on UX research simply because uh, it factors into their decision. So if good decisions are being made based on the research, then they're clearly buying in. Um, trying to think if there... Is there something deeper that I'm, I'm missing with this question? Um, no, not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In that case, if decisions are being made uh -huh. uh, based on user experience findings or recommendations, then it's being listened to. If you're asked to give presentations and nothing ever seems to change, um, <laughs> then clearly clearly they're not. Um, and of course, a lot of it is, is as UX researcher, is, is learning to speak the language of the person that you're presenting to. Um, if you're speaking to a business person, you know, using GOMS analysis, uh, information efficiency, timing-based things um, that that show that a number of more people can use your system than did before, or 10% more people finish a, a funnel. Right? Those are very powerful terms for, for those kinds of people. Um, for visual designers, those things aren't going to mean as much. So you have to find a different set of language to, to talk to those folks about what excites them about the uh, about your, your research. Um, but if they listen and don't act, they don't care. If they listen and act, they do. It's that simple. All right, that's all I have for you. Anything else you'd like to add? That seems, that seems pretty reasonable, <laughs> exception that I feel like I've repeated myself a number of times, which no, I apologize. That's, that's all right. Thank you very much. That was, that was awesome. Thanks Great. so much for uh, your time. Not at all. Looking forward to, to the book. Yep. I'll